Welcome to the Sports Docs Podcast. I'm Dr. Ashley Bassett. And I'm Dr. Katherine Logan. And on each episode, we chat about the most recent developments in sports medicine and dissect through all the noise so you know which literature should actually impact your practice. On today's episode, we're focusing on hip preservation with Dr. Andrea Spiker. We have some great articles for you that contribute well to our conversation on femoral acetabular impingement, or FAI, hip dysplasia, and the arthroscopic and open surgical treatments for these conditions. As always, links to all the papers that we discuss on the show can be found on our podcast website, www.thesportstockspod.com. So we'll start our discussion off today with an article from the June 2018 issue of The Lancet titled, Hip Arthroscopy Versus Best Conservative Care for the Treatment of Femoral Acetabular Impingement Syndrome. This multi-center RCT included 348 patients across 28 hospitals in the UK and compared conservative treatment with physical therapy to surgical treatment with hip arthroscopy. The authors reported that while both groups improved after treatment, patients who underwent hip arthroscopy for the treatment of FAI demonstrated significantly greater improvement in hip-related quality of life compared to patients who elected for non-surgical treatment. Then, from the September issue of AJSM this year, we review the article titled, Progression of Osteoarthritis at Long-Term Follow-Up in Patients Treated for Symptomatic Femoral Acetabular Impingement with Hip Arthroscopy Compared with Non-Surgically Treated Patients. Aaron Critch and the team at Mayo Clinic reported significantly less progression of arthritic changes in surgical patients compared to non op 7% of patients in the surgical group ultimately underwent a total hip replacement compared to 12% in the non-operative group. Risk factors for failure of non-operative treatment included male sex, presence of a CAM morphology, increased age, and initial arthritic joint changes at diagnosis. We're joined today by Dr. Andrea Spiker, a board-certified orthopedic surgeon at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who is dual fellowship trained in sports medicine and hip preservation. She's a team physician for UW Badger Athletics and provides head orthopedic coverage for the UW men's and women's basketball teams. She's also the program director of the UW Orthopedic Surgery Sports Medicine Fellowship Program. Dr. Spiker is an active member in numerous orthopedic societies, including AAOS, AOSSM, and ANA, and she's published extensively on the topic of hip preservation. So we're very excited to hear all that she has to share with us about this topic today. Are you one of the many surgeons who thinks that getting osteochondral allografts is a complex and time-consuming process? Well, you're not alone. But we're excited to tell you that there is a simpler way. At JRF Ortho, they get it. They've heard your concerns and made it their goal to simplify the process. They're not just any company. They are leaders in fresh osteochondral allografts, holding over 60% of the global market share. JRF Ortho is committed to accommodating your needs. Delivering allografts usually around 30 days, and it's all on your terms. You choose your scheduling option, whether it's specifying a surgical date, providing a date range, or just requesting the earliest available allograph. Your preferences are their top priority. And there's more. They offer pre-sutured tendons and meniscus, And ordering is as easy as a few clicks on their user-friendly online ordering system. So why make it complicated when you can make it JRF Ortho easy? Simplify your allograph procurement today. Your journey to seamless osteochondral allograph starts with JRF Ortho. To learn more, visit jrfortho.org. So welcome to the show, Andrea. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and share your expertise with our listeners. It is such an honor to be here and join you guys. I've been listening to this podcast and really enjoy it. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you. No, so thanks part, so much. So part one is going to focus on femoral acetabular impingement or FAI. Now we don't cover hip conditions very much or at all on this show. So for our listeners, we'd like to start off with a little bit of an overview. So for our listeners, can you tell them what femoral acetabular impingement is? How do patients typically present? And what are you looking for on that initial evaluation? Absolutely. So uh, femoral acetabular impingement makes up a huge part of my practice. I'm a hip and knee sports medicine doctor. And so um, this is a, you know, there's a, a, a lot of interrelationships between the lower extremities. And so Um, When it comes to the hip, I would say most often people are describing groin pain, so anterior groin pain. And previously, you know, many decades ago, they would be told this is a groin strain, there's nothing to do about it, you know, stretch more. Uh, And in reality, that's actually probably making the situation worse because what is happening in femoral acetabular impingement is an aspheresity of the femoral head neck junction 
or over coverage of a portion of the uh, the hip socket. And when the hip goes into dynamic positions, specifically flexion and internal rotation, that extra bone coming from either the hip uh, socket or the femoral neck impinges on the labrum, which is a, you know wrapped around the edge of the hip socket. And that over time can lead to tears, it can lead to inflammation. And then actually, especially with CAM type impingement or the impingement where the bone is mostly on the femur, it leads to osteoarthritis. And that's because the extra bone on the femur actually grinds away at the cartilage at the chondrolabral junction. Um, so it's a, it's a very common condition. And now, uh, as we've done more research on this condition, we've realized that there are, there are actually probably more manifestations than just CAM type or pincer type. There's a combined type where people have extra bone on both sides of the hip. You can have subspine impingement where there's extra bone beneath the anterior inferior iliac spine, and that can cause impingement as well. And then now we have a whole slew of extra articular impingement around the hip that can also cause pain and, and deformity. So um, the great thing about femoral tabular impingement is we've got a really good surgical fix for it if we catch it early enough. Uh, no, that's so helpful and such a good overview. And for those of our listeners who listen or watch on YouTube, um, we're embedding different graphics sort of as, you know, you're explaining, you know, as far as like what what is a cam, what is a pincer, all those sort of graphics, because I, I, I do think um, it's helpful to sort of have the visuals, but beautifully outlined, especially for people like Ashley and I, who are <laughs> it's a little bit farther back in the brain and we're not using those. and. Um, Hopefully, Dr. Philippon doesn't listen to this episode and say, what did I train you for? <laughs> um, but you mentioned um, interrelation. You talked a little bit about hip um, related to the knee. Um, one of the things before we go south to the knee, we wanted to ask about because both Ashley and I do see um, like more like the core muscle injuries. So Ashley has more um, of a you know football player sort of dominant, whereas I see a ton of lacrosse. And lacrosse, there's a lot of like athletic pubalgia, and there's been some you know interest in research as far as like what's the relationship between athletic pubalgia as well as FAI, and you know how do you tease all that out? Because obviously there's a lot of overlap of the symptoms, and it can be a little bit. Um, difficult to sort of ascertain, you know, what's causing what and what happened first. Um, so how would you break that down? Well, first of all, I think it's a really astute question. Uh, I, I recognize this in, in my clinic every day. So in my clinic, you know, a, a new knee patient, uh, I have a 15 minute slot, you know, we know our knee exam is pretty straightforward. Hip patients, I, I have 30 minute slots for my new hip patients. And, and part of the reason is we're assessing the spine, we're assessing the core, whether there's a core muscle injury or a you know, uh, athletic pubalgia occurring. Um, we're looking at the lower extremities. So, um, so absolutely, it's not that easy to yeah. tell. I have to build in double the amount of time for every yeah. new patient in order to assess it. Um, but, you know, one of the theories behind this kinetic chain is that when you have less motion at the hip, and that, and that's, you know, a lot of the problem with femoral acetabular impingement is diminished rotational motion or flexion of the hip. And that's what causes the problem. So if you imagine, you know, your spine's connected to the pelvis, is connected to the femur, is connected to the knee. And at one juncture, specifically the hip, it's not moving the way it's supposed to. It's not internally rotating. It's not flexing. It's going to put added stress and strain on adjacent structures. And those adjacent structures are your pubic symphysis, your SI joint, your lumbosacral joint, um, your knee joint. And so when it comes to core muscle injury, that's exactly what we believe is happening is that the hip doesn't move. It actually bottoms out when it hits that bone. And then it's torquing on the adjacent structure, the pubic symphysis and the rectus abdominis muscle and the adductor muscle as they uh, come together at the aponeurosis on the superior pubic ramus. And so, um, you know, I think this has been looked at in the NFL and we see this where, um, you know, there's been papers published where they've looked at the very, very high prevalence of concomitant femoral acetabular impingement and core muscle injury or athletic pubalgia. And there's always this question of, um, you know, what should we treat? Should we treat one and then the other? 
And, you know, I'm biased um, because I do the thumoracicabular <laughs> impingement surgery. Um, and if we end up sending somebody for core muscle injury surgery, they're often going to a general surgeon because it's an approach very similar to a, a hernia surgery that they're very familiar with. And so, uh, you know, with our athletes, I typically will say, well, if, if we have a clear hip problem and we know that you have femoroacetabular impingement, we know you have limited motion in the hip, why don't we fix that problem? Because number one, your hip will feel better. It will move better. We're pre potentially preventing arthritis in this joint, and it will alleviate that extra stress and strain at the adjacent pubic symphysis and core muscle area. And then the rehab for the, the femoral acetabular impingement surgery hip arthroscopy uh, is slightly longer than the rehab for a core muscle injury. And so during that rehab, you can start to see whether the core muscle begins to get better. Yeah. And if it does, then there's no surgery needed for cross injury. Um, yeah, no, that's really interesting. That's exactly going to be the question that I asked, but then I was going to kind of follow it up with when I was in my fellowship, I was working with some players in the NFL. I saw a lot of people having symptomatic core muscle injury, but not symptomatic like hip impingement. When you'd examine them, they were severely restricted in their hip internal rotation. And I'm thinking to myself, well, they don't have any of that classic impingement findings, but they would have a core muscle injury and then, or maybe they'd have a revision core muscle injury or, or a second one, or need to go for a revision surgery or an injection after the fact. If you have someone that has restricted hip motion and a diagnosis of FAI, but doesn't have those impingement type symptoms, but they have core muscle, would you still recommend addressing that cam and that pincer just to get back the motion, even in the absence of that groin pain, just because you see such a clear link between the two? That is a tough question. That's a loaded question. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. I'm so interested. <laughs> so currently the standard of care for the hip is that if they don't have clinical symptoms consistent with femoral acetabular impingement, we don't offer surgery to fix the deformity, even if they have a really big cam or yeah. they have a torn labrum on MRI. And part of the reason is that lots of people do. So there's a really high prevalence of asymptomatic labral tearing, and there's a pretty decent prevalence, you know, I think it's about in the mid 40s for the general population who have some sort of bony morphology consistent with asymptomatic impingement. And then in an athletic population, it's closer to about 60% of them that might have an asymptomatic yeah. bony morphology. That's so a lot. It is very yeah. high. Yeah. And I think that goes back to why we believe FAI forms. And it's because we think it's developmental. So it, especially cam type impingement, we believe that it is because of an overgrowth of the femoral uh, growth plate and the torques that are put upon that growth plate during adolescence. So while the growth plate is open and we have a lot of year round, you know, single sport athletes who are just going at it at a very young age and probably their bodies are responding by laying down extra bone, thinking they're doing something good for the body when in fact it's causing an impingement pathology. So to, Ashley, to answer your question, you know, it's, um, I think maybe in the future, yes, we, we see somebody with a core muscle injury and we say, oh, look, your hip is asymptomatic, but there's a problem. Let's fix it. And, um, and then we'll find out that they don't need that core muscle surgery or they don't need that revision surgery. And I would say in, in some instances, in some of our higher level athletes, that's kind of the route it's gone. You know, they've, they've gone off, they've gotten their core muscle fixed, and yet their symptoms are still the same. And to test that, you could get an intraarticular injection, so a cortisone injection into the hip, and you might actually find that some of their more medial core symptoms actually improve, which will lead you to the, the labrum and the impingement as the source of the pain um, and perhaps that restricted motion that you discussed. Yeah. And I think we, you know, Ashley and I were talking about this um, recently. We just did a little mini episode on core muscle injuries in the NFL. Um, and we were talking about how I would see a lot of them in professional lacrosse, um, but often they were already post-surgery. So they'd have that surgery sometime in college. So sometime in college, they would have a core muscle, you know, repair of some nature. And, but they were still symptomatic, but oftentimes they were also symptomatic in their glutes. Like they would have a lot of glute tendinitis, tendinosis type stuff. And so we're always trying to tease out with the therapists, all right, where's this really coming from? You know, did they miss a step of their rehab? Did they, you know, just sort of get back too soon? Like, why are they, you know, overactive there? Um, so I don't know, that's a very broad question of a patient you have not seen. Um, but, you know, do you have any insight there of like what we should be doing for those guys? Or yeah, so uh, really interesting. Um, in fellowship, I was a part of a study that was an EMG study in patients who had cam type impingement. Mm 
And we found that when the patients, you know, had CAMs, they had decreased firing of their glutamine and menial hamstrings. Okay. And And this was males and females? We did the study in males only, okay. and that was in part because CAM type impingement is more common in males, and pincer type is often more common in females. Um, but I, I think we need to follow up on that uh, because we then need to see what happens when you fix the CAM and right. do the EMG study again. Does it reactivate? But I would say clinically, I believe it does. And patients will tell you this too. They'll say, you know, my glutes have been shut down for years. My PT says I don't fire my glutes. You test them and they're weak. And then even, you know, three months after surgery, they're firing, they're full strength, they feel better. And again, I think it's just getting rid of that cam, allowing the muscle to reach that appropriate length tension relationship. It can move again. And um, getting rid of the bone, I think, makes a huge impact. Okay. All right. You got my wheels turning. (laughs) Well, that segues really nicely into us talking about some conservative treatment, but also surgical treatment. So our first paper was a randomized control trial based in the UK, and it compared conservative treatment under the guidance of a PT to surgical treatment with hip arthroscopy. And before we dive into the results of that and what your thoughts are, we wanted to first discuss what indications there are for conservative treatment, especially given kind of what you outlined that they do so well with surgery. So are you starting with non-operative treatment in most patients that present you? And what does that non-operative treatment look like? Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, the, the answer is always start with conservative treatment first. And, and in part, it is because, you know, hip is, is one of the newer fields in, in sports medicine. And we don't have that really long-term data to show us uh, that we are definitively preventing arthritis with the surgery. Although, more and more papers are coming out, and and um, I, I'm hoping we'll talk about one next. But mm-hmm. um, but so conservative treatment definitely the way to go because there is a possibility that somebody does have pain related to impingement, and that a good course of physical therapy will convert them into that person who has asymptomatic FAI or a labral tear. And so um, so I usually start with physical therapy. We want them to do at least six to eight weeks of PT. And other conservative options, you know, we certainly trial oral anti-inflammatories, a course of um, ap- naproxen or, you know, um, um, ibuprofen and uh, getting them on that medication for one to two weeks to really see if they can calm down some of the inflammation that might have been related to a more acute or uh, growing sized tear in their labrum. And then other conservative measures, you could use intraarticular steroid injections and you know, I definitely use these conservatively. I don't like to use those um, any closer than six months apart. We're very conservative in young patients. But I think that we shouldn't be afraid of cortisone injections in the hip. Um, you know, theoretically, cortisone could damage cartilage. Uh, theoretically, it could cause, um, you know, some avascular necrosis. It could lead to rapid Uh, deterioration of the cartilage. But, you know, it's so rare that that happens. And I think in the appropriate indications, it can really help, number one, potentially convert that person into an asymptomatic individual with FAI and a labral tear. Or number two, we talked earlier about how difficult it is to tease out the origin of pain. When everybody has a tear on their MRI, how do you decide if the tear is actually causing them pain? And the injection is a really powerful tool to help us with that. So if you inject the hip, it stays inside the hip capsule, it only touches the labrum and any cartilage wear inside the hip joint, and then you wait and see how they respond to it. And if they get a lot of pain relief, then you can be pretty confident that it's coming from the hip and that they might benefit from surgery. And Andrea, what it sort of guidance, if you're trying that conservative stuff first, like with physical therapy, what sort of guidance do you give to the physical therapist? Obviously, they, you know, they know what they're doing. They, they have their own, you know, protocols and stuff. But from your perspective, what are you hoping is achieved? Well, it's, uh, I absolutely rely on our, our physical therapists. I think they're, they're very attuned to some of these, um, muscular deficiencies that develop secondarily when you have a cam morphology. But I think, you know, in general, core strength and abductor strength are really important in, in keeping that pelvic girdle and that hip strong. The other thing I really want to emphasize is, you know, for so many years, when people have groin strains, we tell them stretch more, get deeper. If your hip stops there, push it harder. And now what we know about impingement, I mean, that's making the situation worse, right? You're actually grinding bone up against cartilage and labrum tissue, inflaming things, deteriorating things. So I think understanding uh, patients' 
anatomy and their limits of rotation and motion. And some people just aren't going to be able to stretch the way other people can stretch and uh, recognizing that. Uh, one other thing that I think yeah. we should bring up is something called femoral version, you know, f femoral um, antiversion retroversion. And um, that is something that we're learning more about in the setting of a retroverted femur. So a femur that's kind of twisted backwards in the hip socket, that patient's going to have even less motion than somebody with the same sized cam, but who has an antiverted hip. So, okay. you know, they might just be really, really limited in, in how they can move their joint. See, these are the little nuggets that I forget. <laughs> so in the literature, there is like increasing data release that I came across looking at symptom duration and how that correlates with outcomes after hip arthroscopy. And so the message obviously being delivered is, you know, you can't let these people go for too long. You got to get to them to surgery ASAP or else they're going to have a poor outcome after hip arthroscopy. And there were some that looked at, you know, within three to six months, some, you know, within uh, two years or longer had poor outcomes. What's your stance on this? Like if you meet someone who's seen someone else undergone treatment, you know, maybe some maybe some PT, but you don't know how much PT they really did, but they've had symptoms for a year. Is that someone maybe you're thinking of surgery sooner? Or would you put them through another course and kind of trial them yourself? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think one one thing is um, I, I found that there's a big difference in hip PT and then general PT. Mm -hmm. um, and Catherine, maybe you can you can talk more to that. But I think having the appropriate PT is is really important to say that we tried conservative treatment because if you don't do the right PT, maybe they didn't actually have the chance that they could have to get to get better without surgery. Um, but I would say so the the literature has really showed us that there are kind of two time points when we notice that if patients have pain have had pain for longer than that, they do worse after surgery. And that's the six month mark that you pointed out, and then also two years. And it's it's a little convoluted because we don't know why that is exactly. So it could be some of those things we talked about earlier, that their glute med has been now shut down for greater than two years and everything's just haywire. And so it's going to take them longer to dig themselves out of that hole postoperatively, even if you fix the structure of the hip. You know, the second thing is, you know, why does it start to hurt in the first place? Well, it's probably because the labrum tears and there's nerves on the labrum. It could also be because they're grinding away their cartilage and now they have arthritis and arthritis hurts. And so if you leave that go on for too long, the arthritis gets worse and worse. And then you're dealing with a situation where we have irreplaceable cartilage loss. And that's the reason they don't do as well after surgery. So I think you have to you have to take that into consideration as you're indicating patients, um, but it's definitely something that that we think about. And I can't tell you how many patients come to clinic and say I've had pain for ten years, and everybody took an X-ray and said it looked normal, and they told me to stretch more. And you know, so it's it's not uncommon even today that this diagnosis is mi missed. And so I think you know, even if if you're a sports surgeon, you're a physical therapist who doesn't do hips, I think having a basic understanding of what this looks like and getting patients to the right place in a timely manner is really going to change the the outcomes of their uh, potential surgery. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah. I thought actually that was a great article to um, bring up because I do think it, it is helpful for like those of us who are not seeing hip and we're just saying, you know, speaking to someone that comes in, they're already there for their knee and they're sort of saying, hey, this also bothers me too. And, you know, it just reinforces that, yes, I should send them to people like you <laughs> to get um, the full care. Um, as far as conservative, the one thing that we uh, didn't talk about, because, you know, I know less data about it, but what do you see as sort of the, you know, the place uh, for PRP? Um, and some people are doing gel injections off label. Like, you know, do you see that as sort of like, oh, just try it or like, there, but there's no data there? Or is that something that's trending or emerging or it's a total waste of time? Yeah, I, you know, and it's, I think it's probably, um, it differs where you are. For me, you know, PRP at, at our institution is not that easy to come by. Patients don't want to pay for it out of pocket. Um, I, I suppose, you know, based on the literature that we see in other joints and what little literature there is in the hip, that there's probably not a significant amount of harm if a patient wants to pay for it out of pocket and wants to try it. I, I also wonder though, if, those patients aren't just benefiting from the anti-inflammatory properties of PRP or a hyaluronic acid injection, which is kind of what we're doing with this with the steroid as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, what do you, what are you guys thinking as far as the experimental part of that, where we don't really know if yeah. it's, it's going to work, but if you want to try it, I know there. You know, 
in Colorado, there's a lot of people who want to do biologics. Um, it's just, you know, I think there's some more like biologic dedicated clinics, like in the Boulder area and, you know, in the mountain towns. And so there's a little bit more of that out there. Um, there's more um, high demand people who are sort of always looking for, I need to be able to do X, Y, and Z on the mountain. So I think that you know, it's always that discussion of, I really can't tell you that this is definitely going to make you better. But I also feel that, you know, you at, at worst case, you're losing money. You know, you're not necessarily like at risk for damaging something or, you know, it's not dangerous per se. But Ashley, I don't know if you have a different perspective. Yeah, I just my my approach to any of these biologics is just to be honest with patients and just tell them that the data that we have is very limited. This is the cost up front. And I have some patients where surgery is just not on the table for them. It's just not something they can do. They can't handle the recovery at that point. Things going on with family or a trip coming up. And so they, they want something and, and they're willing to say, OK, I'm going to shell out X amount because um, it may help. And if it doesn't, then that's OK. Like you were saying, it's it's low risk. It's not like we're talking about an eighth cortisone injection in the hip of, you know, an, a, you know, a 20 year old we're talking about prp so i think it is low risk it's just being honest with them because i see a lot of people for second opinions that were told this was going to be the magic bullet for their knee mostly yeah. if they're seeing me or their shoulder and it wasn't in their discouraged so i think we just we owe it to our patients to be honest yeah, yeah. for sure awesome all right so let's bounce back to that um, mm -hmm. rct that we already mentioned um and so it also showed um significantly greater improvement in hip related quality of life scores after surgery arthroscopic surgery compared to conservative care so andrew what are your thoughts on this and you know how do you counsel patients regarding treatment options and the likelihood of success well i think that that trial of physical therapy is crucial and i think in a lot of patients, if they don't get better in that initial trial of physical therapy, that the results of this study are probably in their future. <laughs> that, <laughs> that they might, you know, do okay if they continue physical therapy because they're going to get stronger. Their abductors will get stronger. Their core will get stronger. But they will probably do better if we fix the problem if they didn't get better with a, a, an initial trial of physical therapy. And this paper um, was in contrast to some previous papers. So I don't know if you saw some of the previous papers looking at randomized uh, physical therapy versus uh, yes. surgery. Mm -hmm. The problems with those prior papers was crossover. So what happened was, you know, when they compared two groups of patients who were both diagnosed with femoroastabular impingement, they had symptoms consistent with impingement, and one group was indicated for surgery and got surgery, and then the other group was indicated for physical therapy. What happened was about 70% of that physical therapy group ended up having surgery within the first six months. But because of intention to treat statistics, mm -hmm. they then concluded that those 40% of patients that were left in the physical therapy group had outcomes that were the same as the surgery group. Yeah. Um, or you know, 30% of patients left. So what, but, and, and that goes to show that if you get better with physical therapy, you'll probably do fine at two years. But if you don't get better with physical therapy, you should probably have surgery because you won't do as well. And so I think, um, you know, I, I, I try to tell patients a little bit about, well, you know, I you know, absolutely try it, but if it's not better at this point, just based on what we know, it's probably not going to get much better. You can go ahead and put it off for another year or two, but typically those patients will be back and asking for surgery. And Ashley, you mentioned earlier, you know, like the recovery for surgery. And I do, I do ACLs, I do patellofemoral surgery, I do cartilage surgery. And I would say that of all the surgeries that I do, uh, except for maybe the PAO, the periastabular osteotomy, um, the hip arthroscopy is probably the easiest surgery to recover from. So really um, reliably, um, you know, short recovery times, people tend to do well very quickly. Uh, and it and overall is quite a minimally invasive surgery if done technically correctly. Yeah. Well, before we dive into post-op recovery, because we do want to hear about your surgical technique and how you treat them after surgery, but we want to talk about something you brought up earlier, which is can a hip scope prevent the development of arthritis? So our second paper um, is by Aaron Critch and his team at Mayo, and they demonstrated less progression of arthritic changes after surgical treatment for FAI compared to non-surgical treatment. And so I feel like as someone who, I know I don't do hip surgery, but I see a lot of hip patients, and they'll always ask me whether it's hip or knee, hey, if I don't have surgery, am I going to make this worse? Am I going to hurt myself? I'm going to set myself for problems in the future. I don't want to be 60 and hobbling around with my grandkids. How do you broach this topic with your patients when this kind of data is out there? 
Yeah. So I really commend Aaron and his group for doing this because we need studies like this. And unfortunately, um, as I mentioned, you know, hip arthroscopy patients do so well after hip scopes, and it's a relatively minimally invasive surgery if done well. And so it's really hard to do the study where we're, where we say you're going to be randomized to no surgery and we're going to follow up with you in 20 years to see what happens versus we're going to do hip arthroscopy and then see what you do in 20 years because we've kind of known this, right? I mean, it makes sense if the mechanical problem is this bump of bone and it's literally, we can watch it scraping away cartilage. It makes absolute sense. If we get rid of that bump of bone, it's going to stop scraping away the cartilage. We've known that forever, but we need research to support that. And I think this article is, you know, one of the first to demonstrate that, um, that it does appear we are preventing osteoarthritis. And, um, and so, yes, when, when you have that patient who asks you, if I don't have surgery, will this get worse? The answer, I think, is yes, if you have cam type impingement. Now, if they have pincer predominant impingement, we've seen that that's actually protective against cartilage. And that makes sense because the, the hip socket is preventing, you know, the ball is kind of rolling around in the hip socket and the cartilage is pr- protected. It is the cam that is actually grinding away that chondrolabral junction cartilage. Which I have to sort of point out, like for all the podcasts that Ashley and I do, like almost everything is like worse in women, you know, and like if pincer is like the one, you know, more women dominant or whatever, like it's like probably one of the only times I've heard, oh, but these do better. Yes. <laughs> so it's kind of exciting. Yeah. And and I believe this paper did find that that males did worse in the long term. And it is probably because they had more cam and they had more cartilage damage. And we do know that the higher the, the alpha angle, the bigger the cam, the worse the cartilage damage in the hip. So that has also been proven. So Interestingly, though, Catherine, if you look yeah. at a lot of the, the other longer term studies out there, they have the opposite of result. They say that women do worse. But I'm going to give you a piece of my mind about that and why we can't trust that. Because, um, you know, one of the things with with uh, female hips, and this is across the literature in, in orthopedics and in medicine in general, is that, that women have not been studied as much. And there are a lot of differences in the male and female hips. And so one of the big differences is that females tend to be more antiverted. Females tend to have more hyperlaxity of the joints. Um, and if you look back at the early hip arthroscopies that were being done, most of them, they were not repairing the labrum. They were debriding the labrum and they were not closing the capsule. They were just opening it and leaving it open. And so you think about who's going to do worse in that situation. It's a hyperlax, antiverted female hip. And, you know, they had pincer lesions. They're taking down the pincer lesion. They're making them dysplastic. So I think that the, the data is very skewed in saying females do worse because in, in reality, it was because they weren't treating the problem correctly in, in those hips. I'm so happy to have you on so we can hear these things because, these, yeah, I definitely had no, um, no knowledge of that. And that is, you know, I think there was background and all the papers, because we were talking about this recently with Brett Owens, that sometimes you remember like a headline of a paper and it kind of sits with you. And then, you know, it gets dismantled over time because new findings come out or, you know, whatever, there's just more, more data. And you don't always get back to that. And you don't always know, you know, like, okay, but this is really why that data is not perfect. So I think great thing to point out and, you know, Again, happy to have you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think one of the other things that is that is interesting about HIP is that if you look at the the national database studies, about seventy percent of the patients, sixty to seventy percent of the patients getting hip arthroscopy in the United States are women. Yeah. So more women are getting hip surgeries, and okay. then obviously in dysplastic patients, you know, ninety percent of them getting PAOs are are women. Yeah. So, uh, and then I think you know it's it's super important for us to pay attention to those differences, especially yeah. when a vast majority of our patients are undergoing the surgery are, are women. Yeah. No. Well, let's um, actually shift our discussion to surgery. So this is going to be the um, sort of the finishing up of our part one of discussion. So um, can you just sort of take us through the basics of your arthroscopic approach to the patient of the FAI? Like, what are the important things to focus on? How do you generally address the pathologies, whether it's cam or pincer? Um, you know, how do you decide repair, debridement? Do you do reconstruction on a regular basis or, you know, kind of just walk us through the basics of those things? Yeah, absolutely. So I think once you've indicated the patient for surgery, uh, you want to make sure that, you know, they're at least 
a distance out from any type of intraarticular injection, similar to arthroplasty surgery. We want to make sure there's not cortisone sitting in the joint. Um, we, I, I use post-free traction. So one of the big things with hip arthroscopy previously is pudendal nerve paresthesias because we have to pull traction on the legs to open up that very concentric hip joint. And uh, fortunately, over the past few years, we now have a lot of post-free traction options. It's basically a very sticky pad on the bed that allows the patient's torso to stay put while we pull traction on the leg. And this totally eliminates pudendal nerve paresthesias, which is amazing. So we have now eliminated that complication completely. And then um, typically, I'll start with you know radiographic guidance, or fluoro guidance to get into the joint. Uh, I'll, I'll do a very small interportal capsulotomy and do all of my central compartment work, meaning anything with the cartilage. I repair the labrum, uh, you know, at this point, and almost never debriding the labrum by itself. It's always repairing. And I will do a labral reconstruction, typically in a revision setting where there is just no labral tissue left. Okay. So uh, providing that suction seal is an important part of what we think we're doing in hip arthroscopy. Um, and then once you're done with that portion, we'll take the traction off the hip, put the ball back in the socket, and then we enter what we call the peripheral compartment. So this is where that cam could live. Um, and I'll either place suspension sutures in that distal flap of the capsule and pull to be able to see down the neck, or I'll do a small T-capsulotomy um, lateral to the iliofemoral ligament, which is, we think, the most important ligament in the hip for stability, and then uh, ex you know take down the cam. I think principles of hip arthroscopy bony resection just never take too much. You can always take more, but you can't book back what you've taken away. So always using fluoroscopy to make sure that you're not taking too much, being very aware of the size of the burr and how much bone that relates to as you're taking it away. And then just being very conservative, slow, meticulous, careful when you're doing those bony resections. And then another guiding principle is put it back the way you found it. So close the capsule and, um, you know, it, again, this is something that I think is incredibly important. I close the capsule in 100% of cases. And, um, you know, you don't want to make somebody iatrogenically unstable afterwards by leaving that capsule open. I close the T portion if I make it in hip flexion. And then I pass my sutures in the inner portal while the hip is flexed and straighten the leg out before I tie them down. Because I think if you tie the sutures for the inner portal while the leg is flexed, the minute you put that leg down, th those can pop open. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the, it also allows us any opportunity to, to do endoscopic uh, greater trochanteric bursectomy or, you know, repairs if necessary. Okay. That was a great overview. Yeah, you hit, like, so helpful. Three of the next questions that I was going <laughs> to ask you hit the post and the capsular closure. That's awesome. <laughs> that was really good. So now let's kind of talk about post-op. So um, you said it's pretty easy in terms of recovering post-op after a hip scope. Um, do you brace after a routine hip arthroscopy with a labrum repair? So I don't. Um, I don't think there's any literature that um, that I've seen that has convinced me that I need to. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you that those hip braces, patients hate them. Yes. So I, I also hated putting them on as a fellow. So I'm very happy. I'm happy those are gone on the side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. The one exception would be with perhaps your extremely hypermobile patient, your Ehlers Danlos patient, maybe that revision patient who had a, a capsular problem. And it, it helps, I think, in those instances with the patient feeling a little bit more secure. But typically after surgery to protect the capsule, I have two main restrictions. Number one, no hyperextension of the hip, because you could imagine that would pop the front of the capsule open and no external rotation beyond 30 degrees for the same reason that you don't want that femoral head to push open those capsule stitches. Makes sense. Great. And then weight bearing, are they allowed to weight bear? How do you do that? So I typically do 20% body weight weight bearing. And I tell patients, you know, step on a scale, see what 20% of your weight is. That's how you know how much you can put down on your foot. And the joint reactive forces in the hip are actually better with some partial weight bearing than if you have them non-weight bearing and, and lifting the leg off the ground. And so I think that's super helpful. We put them on crutches for somewhere between two to three weeks. And then once they're full weight bearing on crutches with no limp, then we can get rid of the crutches. Okay. Makes sense. That's great. Well, we kind of talked about orthobiologics, but I did want to wrap up part one by just asking you quickly about that, because there was some literature I came across talking about the addition of like PRP into the capsule, like capsular closure or intraarticular at the time of labrum repair. Do you do that or do you see yourself doing that in the future? What are your thoughts on that? I currently don't add extra PRP or BMAC uh, upon closure because I, I don't see that in my practice as a huge problem. Um, you know, I think that there's 
potentially a role, and I'm really curious to see what the literature is going to show us. Uh, and so I think we should all stay tuned. Yeah, I think that's a perfect answer. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Sports Docs. We hope you enjoyed the first part of our discussion as much as we did. On the next episode, we'll continue our conversation with Dr. Andrea Spiker and shift our focus to open surgical treatment for hip preservation. Make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and now on YouTube to stay up to date on all things sports medicine. If you like what you hear, please consider leaving us a review or comment. You can also reach us by email at thesportsdocspod at gmail.com or find us on Instagram at thesportsdocspod and Twitter at thesportsdocspod. Sports Doc Pod. We love your feedback.